Hi everybody, Happy New Year, welcome to 2023. And for the first video of this year, I'd like to go back and answer some of the questions that you guys asked me last year. Actually, a few weeks ago, I put out a question on my community tab on YouTube and I asked if you had any questions in regards to remote ID or anything in general about drones or about the channel. So I'd like to start the year off by answering those questions. Now, some of the questions that you guys had, I did not have answers to. So I reached out to the FAA and they actually sent me some pretty good answers. So I'm gonna go through those and answer your questions that you had for me. So grab yourself a drink and let's answer the first one. This is from Jackson's Drones. And we're gonna answer this one right away. What is remote ID? Now, in case you don't know, uh, in case you haven't been around for very long, remote ID is basically technology that your drone will broadcast information about its flight and about all the information about that flight. And that information is gonna be retrievable by anybody with a mobile device or with authorities or anyone that needs to know that information. And basically the purpose of it is to help integrate drones into the national airspace system. And in order for drones to move forward, at least commercially, remote ID has to come uh, into play. And so it's unfortunate for recreational drone pilots just because of the privacy issues that it brings up. But, um, but it is important for the commercial development and for moving forward with commercial drone use just because, uh, you know, it's part of the process and it's not, it's not something that everyone likes. In fact, most people aren't uh, a fan of remote ID, but it's something that's necessary and it's something that's here and it's something that we're going to have to deal with if we want to be able to fly drones. And so, so I'm sorry to say it's here and it's here to stay, but, um, uh, but we're still gonna be able to have fun. We're still gonna be able to fly. They are just gonna have a few more uh, things that we have to do and we're just gonna to have to be a little more wary of our surroundings um, if we're flying uh, you know, in some certain places. So, but anyway, that's remote ID. Next question is from Tom Z-A, Tom's A. <laughs> How close will someone have to be to the pilot's location or position in order to know their location while using the remote ID tracking function? Will the person doing the tracking be able to locate the pilot at a few hundred feet or miles away? And if you get anything from this video, I hope this is what you take away from it. And that's why I put it early on in the video. Um, everyone's been asking how close do does a bystander have to be to see what you're doing, where you are, the information about your drone? Now, first of all, the information that is broadcast is not gonna broadcast your personal information. It's not gonna give your name, your address, your phone number, and all of that. It's just gonna give you um, a session ID number or a registration number, and then other information about the drone, the speed, you know, the heading, the altitude, you know, all of that. And then also your launch location or your remote controller location if you're using a standard remote ID. So that's where the privacy comes in. You know, it's gonna let people know where the pilot is at all times if they're using standard remote ID. But the question about distance is really important because people wanna know if I'm flying out in the middle of nowhere, there's nobody around. Is there somebody that's two miles away that's gonna know where I'm at and then drive to me and steal my stuff? And so I think that's why people wanna know how close do you have to be? And the answer is it's gonna vary so much according to the manufacturer. It's also gonna um, vary according to the broadcast module manufacturer. So all the FAA did was it set the guidelines that the, the ability of the broadcast has to match the FCE, FCC's um, let me, let me bring it up here. I did get an answer from the FAA on this one and it says, let me look here. How close will someone, okay, here we go. So their answer was the remote ID broadcast is transmitted from the unmanned aircraft vehicle. So it's transmitted from the vehicle. It's not from the uh, phone. It's not from your app. It's not from the remote. It's from the drone itself or the broadcast module. So the distance from the pilot's location to the receiver does not affect remote ID broadcast. The FAA regulations do not specify a minimum broadcast range for standard remote ID UA or broadcast modules. Rather, the rule require that standard remote ID on man aircraft or broadcast modules be des designed to maximize the range of the broadcast within the performance limitations of part 15 devices by the FCC. So, it's gonna vary. It's for some modules, it's gonna be maybe 800 feet, maybe a mile, it might be five miles, you know, for standard remote ID on some situations. So it's really gonna depend on a lot of different things. And so that's why we're not seeing an exact number. 
So I actually did reach out to DJI and I asked them if they could give me like a distance or a minimum distance. And their response was pretty much the same as the FAA. They said, this depends on the performance of the receiver and the radio interference in the vicinity of the receiver. Generally speaking, it can be hundreds of meters to several kilometers away. We're unable to share a precise number as it depends on the environment. So we're just not gonna get a number, like a for sure number of the range of remote ID until we actually see uh, more people using it and seeing what their experiences are and, and seeing what it is in different environments as well. As more modules come out and as more drones come out that are broadcasting, you know, we're gonna start to see what the distance is and we're gonna kind of have an average, we're gonna know, but for now we really don't know what that distance is gonna be. And so really don't have an answer for you on that one, but, uh, but at least it kind of gives us a little bit of an idea of, you know, what the range is. So uh, user FM3Q, whatever the rest of your name is, what actually sends the location, the drone or the app? And as I just stated, it's the drone or it's the broadcast module that's on the drone. Um, and I, I think I answered the rest of your question, user, FM, Q, blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> um, Caleb2364, he actually had quite a few good questions. First one he asked, what will be the effect on flight time? I think it's going to affect flight time. I think it's going to affect... Uh, flight performance. And what I mean by that is the broadcast modules, the aftermarket modules that you're going to have to attach to your drone is going to affect your flight's performance. I think the standard remote ID for drones that have standard remote ID built in, you're not going to see any difference. Uh, maybe a slight decrease in flight time, but I don't think so. I think any flight performance uh, is going to be affected just by the aerodynamics of that broadcast module. So for those of you that are going to be adding it to an old drone, that's going to affect your flight time and, and how your drone performs. Uh, Caleb also asks, how will these aftermarket modules physically be attached securely or just glue? And no, I don't think you're gonna glue. I think they're gonna be removable uh, because I think you're gonna be able to transfer them to different drones. So if you have three different drones, you use this one for you know real estate all of the time, that's your best you know, camera drone or whatever, you're gonna use that for real estate. But then over here, you're doing a thermal job and you're gonna be able to attach that broadcast module to that drone. So I think they're gonna be easy removable, like maybe 3M hook and loop or maybe a strap of some type, I'm not sure. And there aren't very many. I don't think there's maybe one out there now. And I don't even know how that one attaches. Um, I think Ken Heron had one. It's like a $300 module which is ridiculous. I don't think the normal person's gonna buy that one, but um, but as the technology comes out and as we start to see more, I think it's gonna be, um, I think they'll be securely attached, definitely, because if you're gonna pay that much money for something, you don't want it falling off when you're flying, right? So, so yeah. Hockeyfan124 asks, what does the FCC have to do with drones and calls to ban drones like DJI? First of all, FCC does not call for banning drones. I don't think they've ever called for banning of a drone. Um, but I could be mistaken. If I am, let me know in the comments. But um, the FCC has a lot to do with drones because anytime you're transmitting uh, data through the airspace, the FCC has to be involved. The FCC regulates all information that is transmitted in the air. <laughs> and so that's why, you know, because your drone's transmitting information to the RC and back and forth. Also, you know, if you're transmitting, if you're doing a live stream, maybe anytime there's information, you know, television signals, any kind of frequencies, the FCC is involved. And so that's why. Um, Fast Bikes for me says, the remote ID is added to one of the Mini 3 Pro updates. It's under 250 grams. What's up with that? Great question. This is another thing I hope you get from this video. Remote ID is attached, is dependent upon registration. So if you have a Mini 3 Pro, let's say for instance, you just bought a Mini 3 Pro, you're only going to fly it recreationally. You're not gonna fly professionally. You're not gonna make money with your drone. You're not gonna help someone else further their business with it. You're just gonna fly for fun. That means you don't have to register that drone. That means no remote ID, no registration, no remote ID. But if you're gonna use that drone for furtherance of a business, you're gonna use it for real estate, you're gonna use it for photography and sell those pictures or whatever, that means you have to register the drone and because you have to register the drone, that will have to broadcast remote ID information. So that's why you're seeing drones like the Mini 3 and the Mini 3 Pro and all of those sub 250 drones have remote ID enabled because 
if you want to use them commercially, they have to broadcast because they have to be registered. And so, yes, if you only plan to use it uh, recreationally, don't register it in the United States, don't have to broadcast. The first time you use that for any kind of job or to further a business in any way, you have to register it first. And once you register it, then you have to broadcast. I hope that makes sense. Um, I actually was enlightened about that. And that was from the FAA. That was a question that I actually asked them for more clarification. And that is the answer that they gave me. Registration equals um, remote ID. Okay. Um, Gary Sturm 3735 says remote ID is good or bad, good and bad. I don't know if he's asking a question or making a statement, but I think he's right. If he is making a statement, it is good and bad. It's good for the progress of the commercial drone industry. I think it's going to set back the recreational industry. I think a lot of people are going to be worried about their privacy and about their safety because it's going to be available to anyone, you know, their, their location, you know, the pilot location. But at the same time, I think the majority of flights and the majority of people are going to be okay. Uh, they're going to get used to it. Okay. At up front, we just don't know that much about it. It's kind of scary and we hate it. But I think once we see that, um, you know, everything is more open and everyone's more aware of things that it's not going to be as bad as we think it, it was going to be. At least that's what I'm hoping. All right. So it's good and it's bad. Um, next question. What will the consequences for those, this is from Caleb again, will be the consequences for those who seek out drone pilots to harass them? Should there be extra protections? No. I mean, there's already protections for harassment or assault or theft or aggravated assault or whatever. You know, those laws or those rules are already in place. It's already illegal to do those things. So no, there's really no need to have extra protections. And I really am one who believes don't make laws for crimes that haven't existed yet. You know what I mean? So I think... If we get to a point where maybe in a couple of years we're starting to see like this onslaught of drone pilots being assaulted and drones being stolen, then maybe they need to re revisit that discussion and say, well, maybe we should not make pilot location available, you know, to everybody with a smartphone. But uh, but until then, I guess we're just going to have to see. So uh, Woolert says, what, what do I need to get on my old drones to be compliant and we kind of talked about that already. It's called the broadcast module. They're going to vary in size. The one that I watched on Ken Heron's show, it was pretty big. I mean, to me, it looked like about the size of a GoPro, right? Really big, kind of heavy, super expensive. Not for the average person. Maybe for someone with a bigger drone, like an Inspire, or maybe, you know, an older drone that doesn't have remote ID built into it. You know, but I anticipate it's going to be something more like this size, you know, this is the DJI wireless mic. It's going to be something about like this. And, uh, and you're going to have to get one of those, purchase one. I would say anywhere from 50 to $200 this is just my guess, my total pull it out of the air guess on pricing. But, uh, but I think that's what it's going to be. So, so yeah, uh, let's go to the email that I exchanged with the FAA and answer some of these questions. So, are there any FRIOs in existence yet? And if so, what are their size and how do you find them? And the response, no, the FAA has not approved any FRIOs at this time. This was early December. The location of approved FRIOs will be published on the FAA's UAS data delivery service. I'll put the link in the video description and up here on the screen so you can see it. But once FRIOs are available, if you don't know what FRIOs are, basically they are drone parks or RC plane parks where you can go and fly a drone without broadcasting remote ID information. And, uh, and so there's going to be more of those, but they're not going to be coming for a while. So um, let's see, will the broadcast information be available for the general public? And if so, what metrics will be visible? Uh, basically, the broadcast includes all the message elements identified in 89.305 and 89.315. I'll put those in the video description, but I'm going to put them up on the screen here. This is what's going to be broadcast from the broadcast modules that you're going to attach to your old drones. And this is the information that's going to be broadcast um, with standard remote ID. So um, that's all of that. That information is out there and readily available on many different websites and YouTube channels and all kinds of things, but but there you have it. Um, are there any broadcast modules available on the market yet? And do you know the average costs? And the reply was the list of FAA accepted declarations of compliance or DOC for remote ID broadcast is available on our website, 
right here at this website. I'll put that in the video description. The FAA does not track the sale or availability of remote ID broadcast modules. In addition, the FAA does not request or collect cost information from the manufacturers. So it's up to the manufacturers. The FAA is not going to manage those things. Um, that's just something we're going to have to see as the technology gets out there and as they come to market. So I guess we have to be patient for that one. Um, why can't you turn off remote ID on drones that have updated firmware until it's required? Great question. And their response was questions about specific UA models should be referred to the UA manufacturer. So it's not up the FAA to say if remote ID is active or not, it's up to the manufacturer. So for instance, if you update your DJI Avada and it has remote ID now, and I believe it broadcasts automatically and you cannot turn it off, um, you need to contact DJI and let them know what you think about that, but it's not gonna do any good. It's still gonna, it's still gonna be there, it's still gonna broadcast. Don't quote, I'm not sure. I haven't done it yet. I haven't updated my Avada. So I don't know if you can turn it off or not, but uh, but that's the deal. It's up to the manufacturer. It's not up to the FAA. So, uh, and I think that was all I had from the FAA. Uh, again, I asked them about range. I just wanted more clarification on, uh, on the range of the broadcast device. Ken Heron stated that the broadcast module will be similar to the distance of Bluetooth 5. Whatever that distance is, I have no idea, uh, but it's definitely gonna be less than standard remote ID. So, you know, if you have that broadcast module, that's gonna be a little bit less of a distance. Um, their, their reply was, the rule does not provide range specification. And I kind of talked about this already, but I'm gonna say it again. Rather, the requirement discussed in the rules preamble is performance-based. The FAA proposed that the broadcast device use radio frequency spectrum in accordance with 47 CFR part 15, that is compatible with personal wireless devices and must be designed to maximize the range at which the broadcast can be received while complying with 47 CFR part 15 and any other laws in effect as of the date of declaration of compliance. So yeah, and so basically they didn't set the distance, they just said it has to be within these guidelines. So uh, I think that's it from the FAA. So that's all for the questions regarding remote ID. Now let's get to some other questions uh, that you guys had. Great questions. This one I love. Jimmy Johnson, 7041 says, my question is if your drone falls to the ground on private property, are you allowed to go get it? Technically, no. You can't just walk on someone's private property and retrieve your drone. However, that is your property. You can approach the property owner and say, hey, my drone is happens to be on your property. It fell from the sky, landed on your property. You need to return that to me. I would ask nicely first. And if they refuse and say, no, you need to return that to me because it's my property. And if you keep it, you are stealing it. That is theft and I can get law enforcement involved. And if they still say no, call your local law enforcement, tell them that someone stole your property. They'll go to their house and you'll get your drone back, hopefully. <laughs> but no, you can't just go onto private property and retrieve it, even though it's yours. They can't keep it because if they do, they're stealing it. So they have to give it back to you. All right. So that is by law. Anything that happens to fall into someone else's property is still your property. Uh, but, you know, just a matter of getting it back. That's going to be the challenge sometimes. So uh, let's see here. If I have a Mini 3 Pro and say I want to get the Mini 3, do I have to get a new DJI RC with it or the one I have will work for both? Yes, it works for both. And that's great. Um, you know, you can use one RC for Mini 3, Mini 3 Pro, uh, Air 2S, and Mavic 3, Mavic 3 Classic. So pretty, pretty cool. I love that controller. It's the best thing that DJI has ever done, an affordable on-screen controller. I love it. Um, Elizabeth wonders, hi, do you think that future drones will be built with more obstacle avoidance sensors, especially side sensors? Do you think DJI will release a software update for the Avada so users can choose to fly with an RC Pro controller instead of FPV goggles? Nope, I don't think they'll do that. I think the Avada will always be without, uh, with the FPV goggles, excuse me. So, but do you think future drones will be built in with more obstacle avoidance? Yeah, I think that's the future. I think more drones, as, as the technology gets better, obstacle avoidance is gonna get lighter, it's gonna be more efficient, and we're gonna see it in just about every single drone at an affordable cost. It's just like any other kind of technology. It's gonna get better, it's gonna get cheaper to make, and it's gonna get cheaper to buy. So yes, I think that's gonna be a, uh, always gonna be there, so. 
Endless Skies Drone Photography asks, I know how to fly, but I just can't seem to get good footage from the place that I live. I guess that's not a question, it's a statement, but that's a great comment because a lot of people live in a place like I do, North Dakota. You know, the upper Midwest where I live is pretty boring, so you kind of have to drive, you have to travel. If you want to get great looking, beautiful, awe-inspiring footage, you have to go places. You got to get in your car, you got to book a ticket, you got to take a train or a bus and go somewhere that's super cool. There's definitely some places, I guarantee, near where you live within an hour or two that you can find something interesting uh, to capture and share with the world or with your friends and family. But it doesn't have to be, you know, amazing, awe-inspiring stuff. You can create content right where you live because that might be interesting to someone else. So it might not be interesting to you, but someone else might find, oh, that's super cool. And so just keep that in mind that, you know, if you want something that you see on Instagram or you know, on YouTube channels, big YouTube channels, you see beautiful scenery and stuff like that. Those people are traveling. Those people are going places. And uh, so that's what you need to do if you want to get that same effect. So uh, Nature Kala Kbar 1080. What is your weirdest job involving a drone so far? I haven't had any of them. Anything that I do with a drone is pretty boring. <laughs> I do real estate. Uh, I've done some uh, roof inspections. I've done some building inspection type things. Um, I haven't done any like 3D modeling or anything like that. I guess the weirdest job that I almost did was somebody lost their dog. The dog had been missing for a month, but they have had sightings of where it was. and say that they were looking for someone with a thermal drone. And so someone sent me the, like, hey, you should go check this out. Maybe you can help. And and by the time I went and looked at it, that they either found the dog or the dog just they just gave up or whatever, but I couldn't get the information. So, but yeah, nothing really weird. So that's kind of the most far out that I've done there. So, um, Paula Feinberg, Polly, where to find drone paid work that is not real estate. There's a lot of different jobs out there. That's not just real estate. Um, I saw this like picture on Twitter the other day. I can't remember who shared it. I know Bill, the drone reviewer shared it. I think Sally French shared it, the drone girl, but I don't remember, but I saw it last spring too, and I didn't pay any attention to it, but now I noticed it again, but it's got like 30 different things you can do with a drone. So there's a lot of opportunity out there. So Will County Drone, how do I know I'm getting the absolute best video picture set up on my drone while operating? Well, the, I'll say this, I say this all the time, what's best for one person may not be best for someone else, but there's a couple things I recommend. I always use my rule of thirds, my grid lines and my X to make sure that my framing is good. You don't always want your subject right in the center of the screen, right? You wanna use that rule of thirds, you wanna show the environment, you wanna use rule of thirds. Uh, so I always use my grid lines. I always use an ND filter in sunny days. Even on cloudy days, I have ND4 on there, but um, usually I have an ND16 filter that allows me to dial down my shutter speed so I'm able to get that nice, smooth footage. You don't want that jerky, sharp looking you know what I mean? You want that nice, smooth footage. And so, uh, so ND filter, I think is really, really important. Uh, the other thing is to have your histogram on so you can see where your highlights and your, your lows are. You know, we want to have that little histogram on so you can see that everything is balanced as far as your highlights and your lows. So I think those are just general photography and general videography guidelines. But like I said, what, you know, what's absolute best for you might not be the absolute best for someone else. And so, so yeah, just remember that. Uh, and I think I'll finish with this one why, because we're getting kind of long. We're coming up on 25 minutes. Why do you think your YouTube channel got so popular? Uh, and how was it starting out? Well, actually, it wasn't that hard because there was no pressure for me. I didn't have any expectations of building the channel that I have now. I just started sharing the information that I was learning as I was going. And I think that's why people were drawn to my channel because I was sharing information as a beginner. And everyone watching was also a beginner. So they wanted to see that experience through a beginner's eyes. And then as the channel grew and as I became more experienced, those people are kind of grew along with me. You know, we came together through this process of learning how to fly a drone, learning all about drones, about accessories, about the best way to do things. And I think that's why so many people were drawn to my channel because they shared in the experience. They didn't come to me for expert advice. They came to me to see what it was like for someone to do something for the first time that had never done it before. And I think that's why still a lot of people come because I'm still learning. Like every day I learn something new about drones, about um, electric ride-ons, about portable power stations, about anything that I review or anything that I do related to technology or electronics 
or devices. I'm a beginner still, or at least maybe an intermediate now with, with drones. I don't ever think I'll be an expert, you know, resource for people, but definitely I'll have more experience than some people that I can share. But for the most part, when I do stuff for the first time, I'm still a beginner and those people that come to the channel are beginners. And so I think that's what made my channel grow pretty quickly at the very beginning. And then that's what continues to help me grow today. So I definitely not where I want to be yet. Uh, now I got that taste, you know, for being bigger. I, I still got a ways to go. Uh, and I think I'm going to always be driven to improve and be better and, and reach more people and help more people. But, uh, but I'm also pretty happy with what I've done over the past six years. So 2022 was a great year. Uh, I got a lot of great content, got to fly a lot of cool drones. I got to try a lot of new, interesting gear and products and stuff like that. So I actually put quite a few videos out this year and I'm pretty proud of it. I'm not proud of how I kind of let my, my, my overall health go down a little bit as you can probably tell i've gained quite a fit quite a bit of weight this year but uh but 2023 this is going to be the year i'm going to get back in shape right we all say that but no i'm going to do better with balance i'm going to do much better with balancing my personal life my work life my youtube channel my social media all of those things uh, i'm definitely going to do better at keeping things balanced uh, because I do need to take care of myself and you guys should too. So be sure that you take care of yourself this year. So I want to thank you for an awesome, awesome year and continuing to support the channel. I really appreciate every one of you. Uh, this has been such a great experience and it's going to continue to be for, for myself and hopefully for you guys too. So have a great year and uh, I look forward to helping you guys out. And uh, thanks for watching today. Follow me on social media if you haven't already. Twitter, Instagram, TikTok at 50 TikTok, TikTok at 51 drones, you guys. Have a great day. And as always, fly safe and fly smart.